Oh boy, here we go. Last time we looked at a full decade of gaming to highlight the best titles of the 2010s, but today we're going to count down the opposite side of the spectrum. Now here's the deal, if someone disagrees with your choices, it's easy to claim your favorites as simply your opinion. But when you say that a game is amongst the worst out there, it can feel personal, like a knife right to the heart. So in preparation for this video, I thought I'd make a public poll and rank the worst of the decade based on the top 20 suggestions from my Twitter followers. But I discovered that even that can be controversial. People were livid that Kingdom Hearts 3 and Skyward Sword were even on the list at all, despite their heavy criticism. And you know what? I sort of agree. You can't really put games like that next to unplayable messages such as Ride to Hell Retribution, they're in completely different ballparks. So I decided we need a new angle. Instead of the objectively worst experiences of the 2010s, today let's take a look at the 10 most disappointing titles of the last 10 years. There are probably hundreds, maybe thousands of absolutely atrocious games that could be considered the worst but no one has played, and that wouldn't make for as interesting of a list anyway. This way, I'm more or less looking at these entries from the view of public perception, and why they failed to deliver on the hype people had for them. I guess what I'm trying to say is, don't kill me, please. Blame the hashtag angry gamer squad. Alright, let's get started. No Man's Sky promised a gaming feat we'd never seen before. Space exploration across 18 quintillion planets, where each one will be uniquely different than the last. Journey with friends, fight against enemy factions, discover thousands of animal species. It all seemed too good to be true. Well, that's because it was. After not releasing early review copies to news outlets, fans discovered the game simply wasn't finished. While there are virtually infinite worlds to discover, they all felt redundant after just a handful. And yes, while it is technically online with other people, the chance of running into them was next to impossible. This was a statistical marvel to be sure, but wrapped up in a tiresome and repetitive package. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story. To No Man's Sky's credit, the team stuck with it and ironed out all the kinks over the next couple years, releasing the Beyond update in mid-2019, which was widely praised as finally reaching their initial sales pitch. It may have been too late for some, but it's probably the best case scenario for any game on this list, which is why it only landed at the number 10 spot. It took 14 years in development for people to finally play Duke Nukem Forever. While it was originally announced by 3D Realms in 1997, it faced numerous delays and game engine changes before the company was unfortunately downsized in 2009, leading to a lawsuit with Take-Two Interactive and Gearbox picking up the slack to finish the now notorious project. And after all that lead up and hype, what did we finally receive? A game that was clearly made for the 90s market. Who would have thought? Jokes were juvenile at best and offensive at worst. You could pick up your own poop for some godforsaken reason. But on top of all this, it had clunky controls, an abundance of glitches, and downgraded mechanics from previous Duke Nukem entries. Players were flabbergasted as to how this could happen after waiting so long. This game holds the world record for lengthiest development cycle, and the result is living proof that time in the oven does not equal quality. After the deep and captivating world of the Dragon Age series, fans were ready for whatever new IP Bioware was working on next. Unfortunately, that just happened to be a bland loot shooter marred by scrap development ideas and too many microtransactions. Anthem was just as forgettable as it was unfinished, and for a game attempting to foster a large post-launch community, it had laughably poor endgame content. The Frostbite engine, as beautiful as it looks, does not fit every type of game style, and EA seemed to bite off more than they could chew with this title. It ended up as little more than a snooze fest. While it seems to have grandiose revisions in the works, it's hard to forget that it launched with game crashing bugs, some that even bricked entire consoles. Anthem's legacy may be that it felt uninspired, but it's also just the latest victim of bad AAA business practices when left unchecked. Animal Crossing is a widely loved series about adorable creatures and life simulation. After New Leaf released in 2012, players could not wait for the next entry to return to home consoles. That's why Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival was such a colossal letdown. 
If you took Mario Party and removed all the mini-games, as well as any strategy for winning, you'd have Amiibo Festival. Players walk around a board and watch cutscenes while they gain happy points until someone is declared the victor. That is basically the whole game. This is easily the most boring experience on this list, and really is the entry that least resembles an actual video game at all. As the second mediocre Animal Crossing spin-off game to release in the same year, it's clear that this was just a quick cash grab, created as an attempt to sell more amiibo. You're required to have one if you want to play the game at all. So good luck if you bought it secondhand. But it looks like gamers weren't fooled by this facade. It only sold 26,000 copies in Japan. Japan. That is incredible. The second Bioware game to make the list, ouch, Mass Effect Andromeda was highly anticipated at launch. People were ready to jump back into that world and explore the galaxy, but instead were met with this. And this. The majority of Andromeda's issues all stem from lack of polish. It appeared to be rushed out the door before given adequate time to improve. Yet again, EA forcing restrictions on development led to horror stories from the team and directors quitting left and right. The poor animation crew was drastically understaffed, leading to goofy memes and a myriad of glitches quickly spreading across the internet. But the lack of adding anything new or interesting to the franchise was the final nail in the coffin. Some stand by its quality in some areas. And while its vast poor reception may not be entirely warranted, Andromeda is an important reminder of what happens when a secondary team meets massive deadline crunch, and runs into numerous problems and staff changes along the way. You could make the argument that Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric wasn't expected to blow anyone's socks off. But in retrospect, I think it's easy to say that it's the Sonic 06 of this decade, or possibly even worse. At least that Sonic was fun in a so bad it's good way. This is just so unbelievably generic and slow that it hardly feels like it belongs in the series at all. Boring puzzles, lethargic combat, and extremely annoying characters that never shut up are everywhere in this title. You'll feel like banging your head against the wall. But that's to say nothing about the insanely terrible frame rate and overall jank it feels like a cart that's barely hanging on by a single bolt and could fall apart at any moment. It's pretty impressive that a game could ship with such low quality and be so unremarkable at the same time. To put it in the immortal words of Barry Kramer, It's just, it's just, I don't know. This game costs $60. <laughs> but hey, at least we got a half-decent cartoon out of it. That's something. Ah, the game that ruined one of my favorite franchises. Sticker Star was the first and only handheld Paper Mario game, but that's not why it's so heavily panned. This began the tradition of trading creative and original characters for the most basic Mario enemies and no charm or uniqueness at all. But even worse, they stripped any mechanical depth the original games had, and instead replaced it with a simple sticker system, where each attack has a one-time use. Combined with the fact that experience points were removed completely, this led to logically having no reason to want to battle at all. It made more sense to avoid everything and stock up your best attacks for required fights. Super Paper Mario was controversial, but looks like a masterpiece in comparison. These and many other head-scratching changes left us with an empty husk of what Paper Mario used to be, and it has yet to recover since. Star Wars Battlefront 2 may have one of the worst launches I've ever seen. And it didn't have anything to do with the gameplay or graphics. Instead, it was because of all the ludicrous design decisions in terms of pay-to-win loot boxes. Unlike Overwatch and numerous other titles reserving microtransactions for cosmetic-only goodies, Battlefront 2 gave tangible in-game rewards and benefits to those that shelled out the cash. And gamers were not happy. After public outcry, DICE vowed to remove them, except it was only for a limited time. And when it was calculated that it would take an insane amount of time or money to unlock everyone's favorite characters, they lowered the requirements, while also lowering the reward for beating the campaign at the same time, making that original goodwill adjustment meaningless. It was poor choice after poor choice, and felt like the peak of EA testing the waters of just how much they could take advantage of a franchise's loving fanbase without getting caught. 
If Shovel Knight was the perfect example of how a Kickstarter game can succeed, Mighty No. 9 is the exact opposite, and is a huge reason some people are weary of the crowdfunding method entirely. On paper, this looked to be an incredible spiritual successor to Mega Man, with the original creator Kaiji Inafune leading the charge. And after a massively overfunded campaign, hopes were high. But Mighty No. 9's development story was comically bad to put it nicely. Not only did they start a secondary Kickstarter to finish the rest of the content, and start two more campaigns for other projects before finishing this first title, but the delays seemed to be never ending, even after promising it wouldn't happen again. They also released a demo as an apology to fans, which was ironically delayed itself. When the game finally hit the market with pizza explosions, glaring technical issues, and baffling gameplay, Inafune responded to the criticism with, It's better than nothing. Holy crap, that is amazing. We both know why you're here, and that's to talk about the next Fallout. Surely some people will disagree with a few of the entries on this list, but from what I've found through polls, conversations, and general research, there's something we can all agree on. Fallout 76 is easily the most disappointing and downright busted game of the entire decade. Bethesda has always been known for releasing games with janky glitches and unintentional exploits, but people used to write them off because the experiences were still worth playing, saying that's just how Bethesda do. But Fallout 76, which seemed to be a promising idea of bringing their post-apocalyptic wasteland into an MMO setting, has failed to deliver in almost every single aspect. Glitches, disconnections, and crashes are not just common but expected, and happen often. They dropped the price by $20 one week post-launch, right after the early adopters would have already paid the full amount. It feels like it wasn't just released prematurely, no, much worse. This was a deceptive and manipulative attempt at getting as much money as possible from their diehard fans. Unlike most games on this countdown, this one is still broken to this day, and it seems like they dug their grave even deeper recently by offering a premium subscription at $12.99 a month for access to private servers, which ended up being just as horrendous and in some cases worse than the base game. It will take a long time before Bethesda is ever given grace again. In fact, for the foreseeable future, I'm not sure they will ever regain their position of power they once had. And it's mind-boggling to see such a fall from grace come from a company that was so influential. Whew, that was definitely something. For every fantastic experience this decade had to offer, there were some really crummy ones too. What were the most disappointing games of the 2010s to you? Why did they fail in your eyes, and what left such a bad taste in your mouth? Tell me in the comments below, and let's talk about it. In a lot of ways, I feel bad for most of these entries. Without a doubt, they had countless members on their team that were great designers, with such high hopes for their projects. Sometimes your hands are tied when it comes to big businesses, and decisions that have to be made that are out of your control. And to a lot of their credit, many of these games have since been patched multiple times and are actually decent now. I think a lot of the disappointment can be attributed to the gaming community and unrealistic hype, but I hope that in the future we'll see more understanding on both sides. Better working conditions for developers, but realizing they're people too and tempering our expectations as players. Either way, it's important to reflect on both the good and the bad of the industry, so we have no excuse but to improve for the next decade. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty my friends! That's enough about bad games, eh? Let's talk about the good stuff. I'm pleasantly surprised by the positive reception on the last video, especially hearing all of the great memories people had while playing Minecraft. The best times I ever had with the game were playing with friends online. There's something special about building a world with your buddies. That's why today is so cool. Thanks to hosting or sponsoring this video, if you've ever thought about creating your own Minecraft server for your pals, we have a very special deal for you. If you go to hostinger.com slash snowman and use the code snowman, you can get up to 91% off their already very affordable price. Yeah, 91%. And if you're like me and nervous because you've never made a server before, before, they have you covered by offering a wide variety of tutorials and doing most of the dirty work for you. Once you pick a plan, they'll guide you through the rest of the process. They also have incredibly responsive customer support in case you get stuck or need help fine-tuning the details. Once more, go to hostinger.com snowman and use promo code snowman for up to 91% off and host
boost your next multiplayer adventure today. Bye bye